The topic that I'm going to speak on today is wills in the state of Goa. As the topic is vast, it is impossible to cover every aspect relating to wills within the limited duration of this program. However, I shall do my level best to explain a few basics relating to wills, such as what is a will, what are the characteristics of a will, who can make a will, what are the kinds of wills, what exactly can be bequeathed by a will, and the necessity to make a will in certain situations. I shall also touch upon a few misconceptions of the law, which results in erroneous bequests being made in wills. Now, in simple terms, a will is nothing but an act by which a person disposes of the whole or part of his estate. In other words, a will is nothing but a document which contains the wish of the person making it. In the absence of a will, or where the will deals only with a part of the estate of the deceased, the remaining part of the estate is inherited by the deceased person's legal heirs. Now, as per the law in force in Goa, the order of legal succession is as follows. Firstly, it is the descendants, then the descendants, thirdly, the collaterals, fourthly, the surviving spouse, then we have the other collaterals up to the sixth degree, and lastly, is the state. Now I shall deal with the main characteristics of a will. A will is a unilateral act of a single person and can be revoked by that person during his lifetime. This revocation can be made by executing a fresh will, wherever it is specifically mentioned that the previous will has been revoked or by executing a revocation of a will, whereby a person revokes the will that was earlier executed. Now if a person makes two wills, and the second will does not make a specific reference to the revocation of the earlier will, then both the wills are valid. However, the subsequent will revokes the earlier will to the extent of its inconsistencies. For example, in the first will, a property was bequeathed to person X. But in the subsequent will, the same property was bequeathed to person Y. Here, in view of the subsequent bequest in favor of Y, the bequest of the property in favor of X is said to have been impliedly revoked. Secondly, a will is a personal act of a person and cannot be made through a power of attorney holder of the person. Therefore, the person making the will has to make it personally. Thirdly, a will is not a contract between a person making the will and the person named as the beneficiary in the will. And the beneficiary cannot sue the person making a will for subsequently changing his will. Similarly, a person named as a beneficiary in the will cannot be forced to accept the benefits bequeathed to him, but may choose to renounce these benefits. Fourthly, unlike a gift deed which takes effect immediately upon its execution, a will takes effect only upon the death of the person making the will. Fifthly, apart from the disposition of properties, a will can also contain instructions. Some examples are appointing guardians for minor children, instructions with respect to the funeral of the person making the will, instructions with respect to establishing charitable institutions, etc. Sixthly, assets bequeathed in a will, but which are subsequently alienated by way of a sale or gift by the testator during his lifetime are deemed to have been revoked and a beneficiary to whom the asset is bequeathed to in the will cannot claim that he has inherited such an asset only because there exists a will bequeathing to him that asset. Seventhly, wills imposing conditions which are impossible to fulfill or which are contrary to law are not valid. For example, a will stating that the beneficiary shall not marry or shall inherit only if he becomes a priest is not valid. Next, a will has to be a single will, that is, each person has to make a separate will. Two persons cannot make a joint will. So husband and wife cannot make a joint and common will, as the same is not permitted as per law. Then the wills are registered with special notaries. Now the special notary is someone who is at the sub-registrar's office. The same is presumed to be validly made after following all due procedures and hence there is no need of a separate probate proceeding required in order to validate the will. Now the next question which arises is who can make a will? Any person who is not forbidden by law can make a will. Therefore, any person who is major of age and is of sound mind can make a will. A man who executes a will is known as a testator, while a woman who executes a will is known as a testatrix. 
Now I shall deal with the various kinds of wills recognized by the law in Goa. They are public will, closed or sealed will, a printed will and will made outside the state of Goa. Now for any such will, it is necessary that there are two witnesses who are known to the testator and are able to vouch for the fact that the testator is in his perfect senses and free from coercion or undue influence. Now, the most publicized will is a public will. This is executed by a person before the office of the special notary ex officio at the sub registrar's office. In this kind of a will, the testator has to inform the special notary about his wish in the presence of the witnesses and the special notary then records the same in his book. A public will has to mention the date on which it is executed, the place of execution, the details of the testator, the name of the special notary who recorded the will, and the names and details of the witnesses. Today, wills are written in the English language, and if a person does not know to speak or write English, there is a need for an interpreter to intervene in this will. Therefore, if a person speaks only Konkani or Marathi, or some other language and is not conversant with the English language. A mention of this fact has to be made in the public will and an interpreter is required. The page on which the will is written is then divided into two halves with the will written in English language being written on the left hand side of the page while the will written in Konkani or any other language conversant to the testator is written on the right hand side of the page. The task of an interpreter is very important as he has to listen to the wish of the testator in the language in which he is conversant and then inform the same to the special notary in the language in which it is to be recorded, that is the English language. Now the special notary will write down the wish of the testator in his book in the English language and the interpreter is then supposed to read out what is written by the special notary and translate the same into the language understood by the testator so that the testator can confirm that what is written down is as per his wish. Now, a public will has to be signed by the testator, the two witnesses and the special notary. In the case of a will involving an interpreter, the testator, the two witnesses, the interpreter and the special notary have to sign the will at the end of the will on both sides of the divided page. That is the end of the English will and the end of the will written in the language conversant to the testator. Now, a public will can also be executed at the house of the testator by calling the special notary to the testator's house in order to record the will. This is done specially in cases where the testator is very old or is bedridden or is not able to go to the office of the special notary in order to execute this will. Now the advantages of having a public will is that you know that the will is safely kept with the office of the special notary and will not get misplaced. The second kind of will that we have is known as a closed will or a secret will. Unlike a public will which is written by the special notary and only signed by the testator, a closed will or a sealed will is a will in which it is written by the testator himself and then signed by him. The testator can even request someone else to write it for him and can even ask for someone else to sign it for him. If the will is written by someone else and is signed by the testator, such a will does not have to mention the name of the person who wrote the will. However, if the will is written and signed by a third person at the request of the testator, it is mandatory that the name and other details of the person be mentioned in the will and also the reason as to why the testator did not write and sign the will himself. For example, the testator is paralyzed or has fractured his hand or for any other reason. The testator has to then take this will to the office of the special notary who will look at the will but not read it and shall then draw up the minutes of approval of the will. These minutes shall begin immediately after the signature of the testator on the will. The minutes should record whether the will was written and signed by the testator, the number of pages that, is, that it contains, whether it contains any corrections, that the testator was properly identified, that the testator is in his perfect senses and wholly free from any coercion, and that the will was presented by the testator in the manner required by law. Now, these minutes are very important as they verify the competence of the testator to make the will. The will is then put in an envelope and the envelope is stitched and sealed by the special notary and the special notary then writes the name of the person who made the will on the said envelope. The special notary then hands over the envelope containing the will to the testator and makes a noting in his book of the place, date, month and the year on which the will was approved and delivered. The testator in turn 
can hand over the envelope containing the will to either the beneficiary of the will or to any other person of his confidence. He can even keep it with himself. Now, upon the death of the testator, the person who has the possession of the will, or if it is found amongst the belongings of the testator, shall take the envelope containing the will to the special notary. The special notary shall then open the envelope containing the will in the presence of the witnesses and the presenter and cause the minutes to be drawn of opening of the will. The minutes shall record the condition in which the will is presented and whether there are any modifications that have been made when compared with the original minutes that were drawn when the will was closed. The disadvantage of this kind of a will is that the will can be misplaced or destroyed by any person who finds the same amongst the possessions of the person who has the custody of the will. The third kind of will that we have in the state of Goa is known as a printed will. Now, a testator who knows to read may opt to present to the special notary a computer-generated printout of his will on a standard A4 size paper and declare before the special notary that the printout contains the last wish in the presence of two witnesses who shall identify the testator and certify that the testator is in his senses and free from coercion. Unfortunately, till date, printed wills are not yet being accepted by the special notary as they are awaiting for instructions from the government. The fourth kind of wills that are recognized in the state of Goa are wills made outside Goa. These wills are valid as long as they have been executed by following all legal requirements under the law of the place where the will was executed. Now I shall now deal with what can be bequeathed by way of a will. A will basically deals with the disposition of the wish of the testator. Here it is important to note that there are two categories of testators. The first kind of testators is those who have forced heirs and hence can dispose of only half their estate. The second kind of testators are those without forced heirs and hence can dispose of their entire estate. Hence, we first need to understand who exactly are forced heirs. Now, the law basically classifies a forced heir as someone who compulsorily inherits to the estate of the testator. In other words, there are some persons who will inherit to your estate, whether you want them to inherit or not. A forced heir in relation to any person is his descendants and in the absence of descendants are his ascendants. In simple terms, descendants are basically children and grandchildren of a person, while ascendants are parents and grandparents of a person. Therefore, if a person has living descendants or living ascendants, he can dispose of only half his estate, that is 50% of what he owns. The remaining 50% shall compulsorily be inherited by his descendants and the absence of descendants by his living ascendants. The concept of forced heirs inheriting to the estate of a person ensures that the persons dependent on a testator, such as his children or grandchildren, or his parents or grandparents, etc., cannot be deprived of their due in the estate of the testator. The concept of forced heirs ensures that the testator cannot choose to benefit a third party completely by ignoring his descendants, or to choose to benefit one child completely by appointing him as his sole and universal heir and depriving the other children of their due. However, this does not mean that the testator has no rights to deal with his estate at all or cannot favour one child over the other. While 50% of the estate of the testator compulsorily devolves upon the descendants or living ascendants of the testator and is known as their legitim, the testator can bequeath the remaining 50% of his estate to anyone that he wants and this is known as his disposable quota. This disposable quota can be bequeathed by the testator in favour of any of his children or grandchildren or any third party or even to an institution such as church or temple etc. Now let me explain these concepts by giving a few examples. A and B are married to each other. As the marriage of A and B is of communion of assets, they are both equal owners in the assets that belong to them. Therefore, even though A may have brought in to the marriage 80% of the assets and B may have brought into the marriage 20% of the assets, Today, they are both equal owners and each of them have a 50% share in the assets of the marital estate. Now, A and B have two children from this marriage, that is X and Y. In the absence of wills, X and Y shall both inherit equally to the estates of A and B. If, on the other hand, A and B had to execute wills, they would not be able to bequeath their entire estate to X and thereby deprive Y of a share in their estate. This is because Y is a descendant of A and B 
and is hence therefore stay. However, by executing wills, A and B can favor X over Y by giving him a bigger share as compared to Y. This can be done by virtue of bequeathing their disposable quota to X. Now let me explain this with another example. A and B together own 100%. 50% belongs to A and 50% belongs to B. From the 50% that belongs to A, 25% is his disposable quota and the remaining 25% is the legitim or compulsory share of his four stairs or in this example of X and Y. Similarly, from the 50% that belongs to B, 25% is her disposable quota and the remaining 25% compulsorily is the legitim or share of his four stairs or in this example again of X and Y. But as A and B wish to favor X, they can both execute separate wills bequeathing their disposable quota to X. Therefore, the share of X and Y in the estate of A and B will be as follows. X will get the entire disposable quota of both his parents, that is 25% of A and 25% of B, which equals to 50%. The remaining 25% that belongs to A shall be divided equally between X and Y, with each inheriting 12.5, and the remaining 25% that belongs to B shall be divided equally between X and Y, with each again inheriting 12.5. Therefore, the share of X in the estate of his parents is their entire disposable quota plus the legitim that he inherits from both his parents, that is 25% disposable quota of the father, 25% disposable quota of the mother, 12.5% legitim from the father, 12.5% legitim from the mother, which totally equals to 75%, while the share of Y in the estate of his parents is 12.5% of legitim from the father and 12.5% legitim from the mother, which totally equals to 25%. So in this manner, A and B have managed to favor X over Y. But at the same time, the law ensured that Y was not deprived of a share in the state of his parents. Now, upon the death of A and B, it is for X and Y to partition the estate of A and B by either filing an inventory proceeding in court or by registering a deed of family partition in the office of the sub-registrar, where they will be allotted assets towards their respective shares in the state of A and B. If A and B bequeathed their entire disposable quota to some third party or institution, such as a church or temple, then the third party shall inherit 50% share and X and Y shall inherit only their legitim, that is 25% each. So also, it is also open to the testator to divide the disposable quota between two or more persons or institutions in any percentage or share that he deems fit. Now, sometimes instead of bequeathing their disposable quota, that is, bequeathing a percentage in their estate, it is also open for the testator to bequeath specific assets towards the disposable quota. However, here also there are certain restrictions. In the case of a married couple, such as A and B, since they are co-owners of every asset, they need to execute a deed of consent or a deed of acquisitions prior to executing their respective wills, whereby they bequeath specific assets. This deed of consent is a document executed in the office of the special notary, whereby the husband and wife give consent to each other to execute their respective wills and bequeath their specific shares in the assets jointly owned by them. Now, assuming that A and B have executed such a deed of consent, they can now execute their individual separate wills, whereby they can make a reference to the deed of consent that had been executed and then proceed to make their bequests. A and B cannot execute wills bequeathing specific shares in specific assets without first executing a deed of consent. However, upon execution of a deed of consent, A can make a will stating therein that he bequeaths his half undivided share in the ancestral house to X and that this bequest is towards his disposable quota. Similarly, B can make a will bequeathing her half undivided share in the ancestral house to X and that this bequest is towards her disposable quota. So here, instead of bequeathing a percentage of their disposable quota, they have bequeathed a specific asset towards their disposable quota. Now what happens if one of the parents passes away without making a will? Now suppose A and B did not make a will during the lifetime of A. Upon the death of A, the estate of A and B now belongs to B and her two children, X and Y, with B owning 50% undivided share in the estate and X and Y each owning 25% undivided share in the estate. Now the important thing to note is that since the estate is undivided, neither B nor X nor Y own any specific share in any specific asset, but own 
50% or 25% undivided share in the estate comprising of all the sets. In other words, B does not own 50% share in the house or in a flat or in a property, but rather owns 50% of the estate comprising of the house, flat and property. Therefore, under such circumstances of there being an undivided estate, should B choose to make a will, she cannot bequeath any specific asset or a specific share in any asset unless it belongs solely to her, but can at best bequeath only her disposable quota. Here, a common misconception is that upon the death of A, the estate comprising of all the sets of A and B now belongs solely to B, as she is the surviving spouse or the parent of X and Y, and therefore B can make a will bequeathing whatever she wants to whomsoever she wants. Now, this is erroneous, and any such will is not valid, as nothing specific belongs to B. At best, B could bequeath her disposable quota in the estate. Another common misconception that is there is that B, as a surviving spouse, can bequeath her disposable quota in every asset. That is, her disposable quota in a house, disposable quota in the flat, disposable quota in the property. Now, this is also erroneous as there is no such concept of having a disposable quota in any specific asset. The law only provides for disposable quota in the estate. Therefore, if A had died without a will and the estate is undivided, a will by B bequeathing her disposable quota in the ancestral house to X, her disposable quota in the flat to Y is not valid as B did not have any specific share in these assets. However, supposing after the death of A, an inventory proceeding was conducted in court, or a deed of family partition was registered before the sub-registrar under which specific assets were bequeathed to B, then B becomes the absolute owner of such assets and can execute a will, bequeathing specific assets towards her disposable quota. Now, the second kind of testators is those which do not have forced heirs. This means persons who do not have surviving descendants or ascendants. Example, any person who does not have children or living parents or living grandparents these persons can execute wills, bequeathing the entire estate, that is 100% to anyone they choose, or bequeathing specific assets to specific persons. I shall now deal with situations when it is absolutely necessary to make a will. The law as it exists at the moment does not compulsorily require a will to be executed. If there is no will executed, then the estate devolves as per the law of succession of the deceased. This is known as interstate succession. Now, as per the law of succession applicable to Goans, upon the death of a person, his estate devolves upon his descendants, such as children, grandchildren. If there are no descendants, then it devolves upon the surviving ascendants, that is parents or grandparents, if they are living. If there are no grandparents or parents living, then his estate devolves upon his collaterals, that is his brothers and sisters, and in case they are dead, then they are children. And in case there are no such collaterals, a person that is a person did not have any brothers or sisters, then upon the surviving spouse of the deceased. Therefore, if A and B have not executed any wills during the lifetime of A, upon the death of A, his 50% in the marital estate would devolve equally upon his two children X and Y, and B would retain her 50% which is known as her moiety. However, if A and B did not have any descendants, then the 50% of A would be inherited by A's ascendants in case they were alive. However, if they also are no longer living, then A's 50% would devolve upon his brothers and sisters, and in case they are dead, upon their children. It is only if A did not have any descendants, ascendants, or collaterals would A's 50% devolve upon his spouse. This is because, as per the Goan law, the surviving spouse is fourth in line to inherit to the estate of the deceased spouse. Similarly, if A was unmarried and did not execute a will, then the entire estate belonging to the estate of A would devolve upon his surviving ascendants or his collaterals in equal shares. Now, many times parents wish to execute wills to bequeath their entire estate to all their children in equal shares. However, since the intention of the parents is not to favour one child over the other, there is no real need to make a will as even in the absence of a will, the children will still succeed to the estate of their parents in equal shares. However, sometimes it would be prudent for a couple to execute wills. An example would be in the case of a childless couple. This is because, in the absence of a will, 50% of the estate of the deceased spouse will devolve 
upon the family of the deceased spouse, that is, either to his parents or grandparents, or his brothers and sisters, and this can cause a problem to the surviving spouse, especially where the family of the deceased spouse is on inimical terms with the surviving spouse. If B did not execute a will, her 50% share in the marital estate will devolve upon her parents or grandparents or brothers and sisters, and then A will be a co-owner of the estate together with all the other heirs of B, and this can turn out to be a big problem for A. An example would be as follows. A gets married to B. A owned a house. B did not own any, ass any assets. However, by virtue of marriage, B became an equal co-owner of the house. Now, A and B are a childless couple. Subsequently, B dies without executing any will. Now, A does not automatically inherit to the estate of B, as A is only the husband of B and is hence fourth in line as per the law of succession. Since A and B had no children, the 50% share that B owned stands inherited by her ascendants, that is her parents and grandparents, if they are alive. If they are also dead, then the 50% share that B owned stands inherited by her brothers and sisters. Only if B did not have any such brothers or sisters would her 50% share in the house devolve upon A. Therefore, if B has no living descendants, but instead has living ascendants or collaterals, then her 50% share in the house devolves upon them. So in such a situation, a house which originally belonged to A now belongs equally to A and to the heirs of B. Now, A and the heirs of B are considered as joint owners of the house and A cannot deal with the house unilaterally without the consent of the other co-owners. Now, after some time, the family of B as heirs of B decide to file an inventory proceedings in court in order to partition the estate of B. In these proceedings, the house is enlisted as the sole asset. The heirs of B can then ask that an auction be held in the inventory proceeding and in the auction manage to successfully bid for the house. A is then entitled to receive only OLT monies and the house now belongs to the heirs of B. Hence, due to the absence of a will executed by B in favour of A, the property which originally belonged to A now belongs to B's family. Another example would be where both A and B die without executing wills. Here, the family of A owns 50% of the estate, while the family of B owns 50% of the estate. Since the estate of A and B includes whatever rights B had to the undivided estate of her parents, in such a situation, the family of A also becomes co-owners of the properties that belong to the family of B. That is, the family of A get a share in the properties belonging to even the estate of the parents of, the, of B, as the Goan law does not distinguish between self-acquired property and ancestral property. Therefore, in the case of a childless couple, it is absolutely necessary that the couple should execute wills so as to protect each other and their respective families from potential litigation. Thank you.